going to share my I'm going to share my screen here. All right. I am assuming you all can see my uh, my second. I'm assuming you can see my screen there. Is that true? Great. And somehow, gosh, I I should know how to do this, but I lost seeing all of your lovely faces. But I'm just gonna I'm not gonna stress about that. If you if you want to uh, chat with me, please uh, please let me know. Um, all right. So I'm Dan Phileas. I'm going to be talking about my time that I spent at Featherstone Farm, uh, where we grew 140 acres of vegetables. I am currently the field specialist for commercial vegetables and specialty crops with ISU Extension. And uh, in addition to working at Featherstone Farm, I've managed other farms like Middlebrook Farm south of Des Moines and the Michigan State uh, University Student Organic Farm. Um, but I was at Featherstone Farm from 2015 to 2018. Um, where we had 250 acres and 140 of those were in vegetables each year. And <laughs> you may cringe at this, but almost all of our acres were leased. We only owned, when I first got there, a small three acre parcel where all of our uh, greenhouses and warehouse and office buildings were. All of our vegetable production acreage was leased. Uh, we're slowly, uh, they are uh, slowly working their way to buying more land they own uh, some now, but it's still a very small percentage of what they actually farm. Certi it is a certified organic farm in the summer has a lot more employees than in the winter, 50 in the summer, 15 in the winter. It's in Southeast Minnesota, just North of Decorah. Most of our fields are look like this one here in the picture. They're in the river valleys, though to diversify the and spread out the risk, there is some acreage on the ridge tops. Um, there's a long story behind uh, about, about risk and flooding behind, uh, for Featherstone Farm, but I don't have the time to get into that today. Um, here's a map of the from Google Maps today. I've got, um, let's see, can you see? Can somebody chime in? Sit, let me know if you see my cursor moving around here. Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe if I press control there, it's like a laser pointer. Does that look better? Yep. Okay, great. So that, that scene that you saw right there was one of these valley fields down here. These field, this, this field right here is about 75 acres. This one over here is about oh, 40 acres. Um, and this is where we, our irrigation pump was on the river. We would pump water up into those fields. We have a well right here where water is pumped up out to these fields. Um, so yeah, the, the, the greenhouses and the offices are right here in this like business park. This is a, a concrete plant and this is the electrical cooperative. And then when we wanted, we have fields up on the ridge top up here, this winding road goes up this drainage and then up to this ridge top where there are lots of fields up here as well. Um, and it was roughly a three mile drive on the road to get up to there. Um, I'm gonna play a short video here from YouTube. I, and if this is, it played all right for Lance when he was, he and I were on this, but um, if it's super herky jerky, um, then please chime in, let me know if it's just not worth it because I don't want to waste three minutes of your time with a, with a crappy video. Um, so I am going to new share over to the video. All right, do you see YouTube now, Lance? Or yeah. anybody, you see YouTube instead of the slideshow? Yep, it's Great. up there, yeah. Okay. And let me know if right away if the audio is not playing, but otherwise I'll assume it is. Since this has left me curious about what exactly it takes to provide fresh food year round. So I head to a local farm to see how crops like theirs make it to me, the consumer. My name is Jack Hedin and I'm the owner and farmer at Featherstone Farm. We manage just over 200 acres of land. Of that 200, about 130 acres are vegetable crops. We grow pretty much any type of vegetable that can be grown in Minnesota. Everything from uh, asparagus in the spring of the year through carrots in the late fall we harvest. We do a lot of fresh market stuff, you know, that picked one day, shipped the next. We also do storage crops where we harvest cabbage in the month of October, store them in the coolers, and then take them out, wash, pack, ship, little by little all through the winter months right through March. 
So to have crops available year-round at the grocery store, what does that involve for you? For to have an eight or 10 week supply of broccoli, September and October, mm -hmm. we need to put out six or eight plantings of broccoli, two acres at a time. And they need to be very carefully sequenced on, in a timing so that they are planted, mature, and are harvested in a sequence that allows us to provide a, a steady supply to a store or a, a, a customer of some sort. We have about 50 people working at the farm, um, a horticulture team of six people that are specifically tasked with this very thing of yeah. keeping all these balls in the air. Yeah. What is different about your farm versus most other farms? Lost the video. Oh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so sorry, y'all. Pausing. I was goofing around there trying to get my, my video panel to show and I messed it all up. All right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna belabor that anymore. I'm gonna just close that up. Uh, hopefully uh, that gave you some perspective on what some of those fields look like with those drone shots going over there of uh, of Featherstone. And I am going to um, do you see are, are you seeing my uh, my my PowerPoint presentation again? Lance? No, I no, okay. seeing great. I'm just great. Um, I'm going to go back to the screen share and PowerPoint slideshow share. You should be able to see it again. Is that right? Yep. And if you want to send that link to me, I can forward it on to everybody. You know what? I would. Um... Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know what I can do? I can just copy. I'm just going to put it in the chat, everybody. Okay. And resume share. Um, where is that chat? Boom, there y'all there y'all go. All right, I'm assuming you're still seeing, still seeing the slideshow. Yep. Okay, great. So here's some perspective of from the fields, from the ground level. Here's the our tomatoes, our cabbage field, lettuce, kale, peas. To market it, we did 33%. A third of it went to uh, CSA, um, 750 to 1,000 shares. And two thirds of it went to uh, went to wholesale. And most of that was going to the Whole Foods Distribution Center. Some of it was going to Co-op Partners Warehouse up in the Twin Cities, which would then send it out to all the co-ops like Wheatsfield Co-op uh, or uh, New Pioneer. Um, and then direct store delivery, we also did um, where we self-distributed that. Yeah, I, I guess I should clarify, Whole Foods sent us two of their semis every week and then took that crop back to Chicago. And then we hired a semi and that went up to Co-op Partners Warehouse once a week. And then we had a couple of box trucks that did CSA delivery and uh, and the direct store deliveries. Uh, this is a picture of our of our machine shop. The machine shop is this space right here is a heated one so for, for year round maintenance. We got some lean twos, solar panels on the roof. This building over here is our break room, restrooms, uh, office building, et cetera. The coolers are spread between the two buildings and the warehouse is in the building on the right that you can just see a tiny bit of. We used a lot of plastic mulch. I am embarrassed to say that we used 83 miles worth of plastic mulch every single year. Uh, we did use 84 miles of beds without plastic, um, but that it was, uh, that's a lot of plastic. And um, yeah, that's enough of that. Um, tools, the topic of this, of this discussion is what tools and systems allowed us to do the work that's needed on a vegetable farm on this vast acreage. And for me, coming from the Michigan State Student Organic Farm at where we were doing, you know, 15 acres, and not all of that was in, was in cultivation. It was a lot of high tunnels. We had maybe, you know, five to seven acres of that was actually tilled up and planted. It was it was eye opening and and kind of daunting to start managing that space. But there were systems in place, and they had the tools that allowed that to happen. And I'm going to review those with you right now. So this is. Uh, 
a lot of text, one of my more text heavy slides. I'm not going to read this all right now um, because I, I've got slides about all these things later on. But the point that I want, the one thing that's not in the slides to come is, well, there's a lot of machinery here. And then we had two mechanics who were more or less full time. Uh, I would say they're probably 0.75 FTE because they were um, full-time equivalent because in the winter they took time off and they did some field production work in the summer as well. But things broke because we relied on old equipment and we needed to have mechanics on staff to fix that stuff. And when something went down, we didn't have the luxury of waiting a couple of days for it to be fixed. So we increasingly relied on redundancy. So we had two of a lot of different things so that when something went down, we could get right back out in the field and using that other implement. Wasn't always that easy, but uh, that was the goal. So here's the big tractor that we used for primary tillage, uh, north of 100 horsepower. We used it to pull a few implements like this offset disc. And there's a picture of the implement in the, in the, in the right-hand side there and what it does in the, in the lower part there, medium duty. We've got the ch uh, chisel plow. And this is uh, good for not inverting the soil layers and actually doing a really good primary tillage. Um, and this was something that we were, when we had a field that we needed to use early the following year, we would chisel plow it in the fall because a chisel plowed field from the fall will dry out faster than, than one that's been disked or rototilled. So it, we do that primary tillage step, even though it would leave it bare, we would just try to focus on just those ones that we needed early, like the first planting of lettuce or in peas and things like that. Um, this is a finished disc. These wings up here would fold down and it would make this nice texture soil. This was uh, for light duty incorporation. It was our last pass before we'd shape the beds uh, or seed cover crop. Another tractor we had was this uh, all purpose John Deere 4020. We used it to pull all sorts of things. We had a number of, off, of uh, offset cultivating tractors, two of these Kubota L245Hs, this Ford 1710 and a Farmall Super C. We had these high crop four wheel drive tractors that could straddle uh, almost mature crop. Uh, these things had creeper gears so they could go tremendously slow for transplanting or pulling a harvest conveyor, uh, something that you know you need to be walking slowly and doing work next to or riding behind and planting like tightly spaced onions or things like that. Very versatile. We also use this to make all of our beds because the four wheel drive. And a couple hydrostatic transmission tractors also drive slow so we could transplant. We use these for mowing and pulling trailers also. These are the two of them. You can see this one's <laughs> tried to get out there in the field a little too early. Uh, it's a little wet there. We had a skid steer. Uh, I, I don't think I need to say any more about how useful those things are. And because we had so many workers, we needed a fleet of trucks and vehicles to get out to the field and around or up to the ridge or down back down to the valley. We had a forklift in the warehouse, which did some of the same work as the skid steer, but was much is much more precise than a skid steer. So it could do things like this uh, 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 and get close. I, I, I preferred it for doing things like this, but it was essentially a warehouse tool. Uh, one of the implements we used uh, after a while was a, a drip tape winder to get all that drip tape back in. It made uh, the job a lot easier. We got a vacuum seeder, which I'll go into in a little, a little bit more later, which made for precise seating. Um, I'm just going to skip past those and get into that later. Uh, we had a, two of these bed makers. We used plastic mulch only for drip irrigated crops so that the drip tape wouldn't blow all over the place and so that we could have some of the uh, weed suppression um, of, that the plastic mulch offered. Black for the warm loving crops and spring crops and then the white for the cool loving crops all throughout the season. We also use that same bed shaper for making dirt beds. There is a setting on this thing that's down in here that makes these little wings spread out wider. So we spread it out to its widest setting to make a wider bed top when we would plant into dirt. Whenever we are planting into plastic, 
we would use um, we would use the water wheel transplanters with either one of the hydrostatic tractors or the high crops with creeper gear for that slow driving. And then here's a video of, uh, of another transplanter, this mechanical transplanter 5000, a carousel type planter. Pop the transplants in, it drops them in. It's got a little picker shoe that, that knocks them out and those press wheels that plant them in the ground. This allows us to go much, much faster than a water wheel but it can only be done in the uh, bare dirt beds. Organization was a tool. You might, it's kind of a cheater thing to say of a tool. It's more of a system, I suppose. But uh, we had this, um, this sort of like a, a bike rack almost for our water wheels. Um, here to store those that worked really well for storing those things. It was homemade from our, our, our machine shop guys. And then check this out with the paint pens. If you don't already have things written on your implements or tools to help you out, like this is the, sp the number of spikes that go into a, a super wheel. The super wheels are the ones where you can change where the spikes are on the outside. Um, the number of spikes for the inch spacing. This, because we were always having to look this up. So we just wrote it on the side with a paint pen. And you can do the same thing with uh, where your cedar units should be on the toolbar. That's another place that you can draw on the toolbar with a paint pen, these things. Make it easy for yourself and others. Because we had 50 people uh, at this farm, we had to be able to put the information where the action was happening. Um, one of the other tools we were using uh, in propagation, this uh, is a vacuum seeder. If, um, if you're seeding multiple trays of a plant, then all at one time, it really makes sense to get a vacuum seeder and just seed that whole tray in one go. It's, we found it was, you know, we tracked labor hours extensively at Featherstone and we found that we could seed two and a half times as many trays in the same amount of time um, with one of these things. It was required, we did need to get pelleted seed for many things like lettuce and anything that was irregularly shaped. Brassicas being little spheres, those were fine with going in here. And I've put a link here um, that is a, uh, if you go to Martin's Produce Supplies, there is a, an Amish made vacuum seeder that's a quarter of the price, maybe a third of the price of the one in, jo in the Johnny's catalog. So if it's a price thing for you, uh, you can you can certainly get it for a lot cheaper from Martin's Produce Supplies um, at that at that link. And I'm not going to jinx it by trying to copy and paste that into the chat right now. Sorry, y'all. And so that was Propagation Tools 1.0. That was when I was there. But since I've left, they purchased this needle seeder, which uh, it, it dibbles the trays, it seeds them, and it covers them all with vermiculite. And it moves them along, and you just put the tray at one end, and you pick it up at the other. And they, um, when I talked to Abby up at Featherstone, she said that it has cut 60% off of the labor. Um, this is a two-person operation instead of a uh, five to seven-person operation now. Um, huge savings for them. Uh, of course, there's upfront purchase cost, but they're very, very big on this. Um, but it, it, they had to get new trays for it, though, because it only takes 192s. But that also saves on space because you've got smaller transplants and can fit more of them in a greenhouse. All right, for irrigation, we were using these water pumps. This big orange one is the Godwin that would pump out of the river. The green one is from rain flow that pumped out of a pond to a small, um, to a smaller field nearby. And then we had other assorted pumps for pumping from storage tanks and our water reel. This water reel right here. So uh, if you're not familiar with the water reel already, this is a big this is a big roller of of uh, pipe poly pipe and you pull a sprinkler out to the end of the field and the you turn on the water and it starts ch -ch 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 all the way all the way around and can water an acre uh you know at, at, at a you know at a, oh, <laughs> i guess um I think it's actually not just one acre i think it's more like four acres that it can water by the end of the uh the end of this thing um 
and it automatically retracts this thing back in, rolls itself up, and when it gets to the end, it auto shuts off. The only bummer about it is you need high volume, uh, decent volume and high pressure. So we've got this booster pump right here running and this booster pump didn't have a big enough gas tank. So we needed to go out there and refill this thing uh, so that it would last the entire time that this um, thing was out there. That is one uh, change that I think they've made since I was there and took this picture. For pest control, we used boom sprayers that sprayed four beds at a time on one side of the tractor. It needed a drive lane in order to accommodate that for tall crops because the sprayer couldn't straddle the tallest crops. So we'd make a block of eight beds, then a drive lane, then another block of eight beds for that tractor to go down and spray. And also that was used for harvest. Speaking of, this tractor with uh, with the Nolts harvest conveyor here would use the same spacing. This thing stretches across four beds. And then we've got four people walking here, harvesting one bed at a time, harvesting these zucchini that get brought in and stacked in these crates right here. That was one of our conveyors. We also had the veg bear, which you saw in the video um, the, that, was, that I was from YouTube. And then we had the broccoli belt, which I'll be getting into later. And then here's another video of what we harvested our carrots with, a Scott Viner. So the Scott Viner is a tool from the 1950s, I believe, and uh, it sounds like it. I'm sure you could hear the squeaking and squealing in there. We greased it every day. There are about 50 grease points on that thing, but still squeaks and squeals. Um, all right, in the warehouse, some of the tools we use, you, you probably recognize these green, the green brush washer here. Maybe you all have a bin dumper on your farm already. Um, we would dump those carrots out and sort them on this table here. In the warehouse also, we were using electric pallet jacks. We were moving big pallets around and it was, um, I thought it was kind of overkill at first, but it was, I, I sure grew to appreciate having an electric pallet jack to move those things around. And then we had a thermal label printer that uh, printed a number of things for us, but one of them was these, these labels for our storage bins and all these labels, these green and yellow and purple labels that you see on these boxes here would be printed by the thermal printer that was in the warehouse as well. So Thero was the brand. And last picture in tools, rest in peace, I'm so sad, Reuters Farm Equipment from Michigan, they closed in the fall of 2021, just a few months ago. And this was a, a, a they were, a, a, a major part of the upper Midwest machinery, vegetable production machinery, um, you know, equation. They had a massive acres and acres and acres of equipment. They would scour the country buying the stuff, and then they'd make two or one or two trips out uh, this way every year and drop off, you know, uh, the, uh, the the machinery that people had ordered. So we would see Mark Ruder, oh once every once or twice a year when he would be dropping off something for us or picking it back up uh, because we'd sell something back to him. But I'm very sad and I don't, if any of you know a solid replacement for Reuters, I would love to know who, who it is that, that, we, that we should re be relying on at this point. Um, but they were a, a big used machinery sales place. All right, so tools, th those were a bunch of tools that we used, but we had to incorporate those into systems in order to make it all work. So these are some of the systems that we relied on. For us, we relied on labor continuity and I think all vegetable farms, all farms period, rely on labor continuity. So you don't have to keep training somebody each year uh, or a new person each year. For us, the way that that worked was H2A visa labor from Mexico. Um, we had a solid relationship with family, the, uh, one community in Mexico, many families in that community in Mexico, and we had multi-generational um, uh, visa workers from that, from that community who um, 
we could we just couldn't have done it without them. Um, other systems that we relied on were making uniform beds, stale seed bedding, a Kanban system, which I'm I'm going to get into all these things. Uh, Kanban and a map uh, and decreasing all the variables that are in the system and sorry and supporting and supplying all the tasks that were going on. So for H2A visa labor, um, if you're if you're not familiar with that, it's a temporary visa program that you go through the government to get uh, or you apply through the government to allow these workers to come in and it's they cannot be here for the full year. You have to set a certain time period that they're going to be working on your farm. And while they're here, you are providing them housing and um, a way to get to the grocery store and get food and transportation to and from the farm if they aren't living on your farm already. And the government sets a minimum wage. This year in Iowa, that minimum wage is $16.20, I think. And, um, and yeah, you have to pay their way to and from Mexico and their food and, and everything while they're on their way to and from Mexico. Um, so uh, the advantage for us was that we had folks coming back, you know, five, 10, 15 years to our, to our farm from this program. So, and, and meanwhile, anybody who is domestic would come to the farm and would be there for two, three years max. And so there's a lot more turnover in our domestic labor. And you had, do have to document that there's, or search for domestic labor so that you're not, you know, displacing domestic labor with uh, immigrant labor. But um, it, that, that, that never was a problem with um, in our rural corner of Minnesota. There are challenges. Uh, you, like I said, you do have to pay for a number of things, housing and cars. Um, there's a lot of paperwork and hoops that you have to jump through. Uh, we would always be biting our nails when they would go to the immigration office for their interview in Monterey and to get the final okay, because if, if one of the workers has, if a person has a, any part in the, any time in the last 10 years of a documented like uh, documented, undocumented status, um, if they've been caught here as an undocumented immigrant and sent back, then they are not allowed for another 10 years to be an H-2A visa uh, laborer. Um, and another challenge is having somebody who, who's working with these folks who is bilingual or speaks their language. Uh, and that was a challenge for me at first. I took it in high school, but I got better and better and better each year. Um, sadly, I've forgotten a lot of it. Um, uniform beds is another part, another system that we had, and that ultimately became, uh, the system was chisel plow, then finish disc in the same direction that your beds are going to go, and then follow that with the bed press. We had tried going 90 degrees perpendicular, and that just made for a really rough ride for the bed shaper and also poor texture. And so this was our, our, our best system for making uniform beds. And we also needed, got really good at having a driver who could make these beds uniform distance apart. 5.75 feet was what we were shooting for between the centers of these beds, which leaves no space for, that gets uncultivated in the pathways. We used a, a shovel at each end of the field tying the drip tape to one of the shovels going at the other end, grabbing the shovel, shoveling out over the, the edge that gets cut and then sticking it in the ground and having the same scene on the other end. And we left dirt at the end, oops, sorry, I went dirt at the end of the beds here so that you could make a pass across this way with the rototiller to level it all out. Looking like a dream out here. So you can see on this one, maybe you can't, it'll, it'll maybe be more obvious later in another picture of mine, but this one is before we really got our good system. You can see the beds are kind of rough looking, a lot of debris. And then in this area right here where the circle, the oval is, is a wide section that's going to not get cultivated. 
when a cultivating tractor goes over this bed, it's going to be just cultivating here. When it goes over this bed, it's just going to be cultivating here. And there's going to be a ridge of weeds that we're going to have to do extra work to do or to go out to that field to take care of that. And that is a problem. And we also had to have this person, the person who's on the job sitting on this disc in order to have it dig in enough before we implemented that new system of chiseling then finish disking. All right, once we have those beds, we, uh, we stale bedded them. And this was key for limiting how, how the uh, having a lot of weeds germinating. So what we did was we had baskets and tines and um, this picture on the left is the, these, oops, gosh, these beds are not yet stale bedded. These ones are, you can see the tine tracks in there. And so they've got baskets on the belly of the tractor and tines behind the tractor. The baskets will cr uh, crumble the soil and the tines will drag those cr the crumbles and make sure that nothing is uh, getting, is that the weeds are all uprooted. Here's a video of it happening. There's a nice little weed right there, uprooted, white thread stage, perfect time for it. By getting them at this stage, we, it prevents us from having to go through and hand weed them later when the, plant, when the crop is in the ground. Those tine weeders are good at removing the plastic scraps, as you can see here, but if too many of them get in there and, there's actually, and you're trying to take that over some crops, it really does damage the plants. So we had to be careful there. And that was good motivation to remove the plastic well at the end of uh, a season. You can see here, this one bed on the left, this one didn't, uh, uh, is, is pre, it, it, this is like after one or two stale bedding passes, probably one, and then this is after two stale bedding passes here. You can see one bed here got missed, this one right in the middle got missed by the person stale bedding. And this is post seeding. I can see some carrots in these beds right here. Um, so this one is probably going to have to get tilled in because it's just not worth it to hand weed that bed. So the University of Kentucky did some science about this research about stale bedding. And this is the system that they were using. They had this elaborate thing, but it worked so much better than ours because it rebuilt the bed shoulders, made a nice flat bed top smoothed it down right here. This is another one that's on the market from Buckeye Tractor in Ohio. And this is the general uh, system. They would do it every 10 days and they would try it once, twice, three times, or four times. And then they'd harvest all the weeds and they'd weigh all those weeds. And look at this, by doing two passes with a stale seed bed or stale seed bed passes, excuse me, that re resulted in 42% weed reduction three passes was 93% gone, and four would be 98% gone. It's just astonishing how well that works to remove those weeds. And we didn't wait 10 days, we would wait more like five to seven days um, between our passes, but it would really make a big difference. This one was not really, I think this one was, did not get the full, um, as many passes as we wanted, and it is kind of weedy, but, um, we did have a crew out there hand weeding every single row foot of carrots, and we grew a lot of them, 38 row miles of carrots we grew every year. And this is what it looks like afterwards. But the goal is to have one or two weeds every foot or two so that you can just sort of walk, bend down, pick it up, and pick that weed out and keep going, not have to crawl on the hands and knees. So another system was to support and supply the tasks that are out there on the farm. This is uh, an example of a squash harvest where it was my job to get trailers full of bins so that, uh, so that the crew out here who's collecting squash doesn't have to sit around and wait. So here's a truck that is staged with, with eight bins here or six bins, excuse me, and that I'm gonna be moving those onto another trailer so they can just come and grab trailers full of these things. Um, I would come in, my schedule was 
Sunday through Thursday, even though most of our heavy uh, production work was Monday through Friday, um, so that I could make that work plan on Sunday uninterrupted and then set it up, set the board up, the work board that we had for everybody. And uh, also, um, we expected people to be to clean up after themselves on the farm to keep a clean workspace, but we never gave them time to do it. And so we didn't have a clean workspace. So if you expect, it's my philosophy that if you expect somebody to do something, you have to give them the time and the tools to do it. So the first 15 minutes of every Friday, I started calling Friday tidy. And uh, we signed up for different jobs and cleaned up the bathrooms and the and the all the kitchen space that was in there that we made lunch at. Um, and it, it was a lot better. I mentioned decreasing variables. This is one instance of that where we had a lot of different type. Uh, this was one weird way that we had fields going where we had this every 12 feet with cover crop in between. And this was a completely cover cropped field before. And we were met, expected to go out and like find a place for each of these beds, which uh, meant that they were never the uniform distance apart. And when these, when this oat crop died, it was just be weedy and we couldn't cultivate the squash. So by making these just the way we made everything else, 5.75 foot between beds, it was less confusion. We were able to cultivate it until the squash vined out. And we ended up getting higher yield per acre because there were more beds per acre. We just, in order to grow those squash at a similar spacing, we just increased the in-row spacing. <laughs> Here's another example. Uh, <laughs> we had a hodgepodge of pipes with um, not the right connectors so that they would st uh, stay latched on for our irrigation. And this worked at the time. It was, I was pretty uh, impressed with the solution, but um, ultimately we just needed to have the right supplies. We needed support and supply so that the right, so the job could get done. Cause this took a lot more time than just having the right supply. I mentioned a Kanban board and this is basically just a task board. Um, this is used a lot in like remote work for like uh, IT stuff and uh, software development, um, but it works also for tasks that need to be done when there's a lot of people all not in the same place at the farm. And we started with a uh, pen and paper because we were tracking all of our work on these colored coded clipboards down here. Um, if you had a red job, you wrote it on the red clipboard. Ultimately, we got an iPad here and, it, and entered it all into that, which put it right into a spreadsheet for us to track, which was a lot easier for both because we didn't have to type that stuff in, take a week out of our fall and type all that information in. And it, um, it ended up being easier for our workers too. Um, we had mag each worker had a magnetic name. Uh, and so, and then they, I, I would go in each morning, I'd come in an hour early and set up their workflow for the day. This is a team right here, Pancho Oligario, Antonio and Jose Emilio. We're gonna go out and transplant with these two uh, sheets right here. And then when they finish that, they were to go down and work on the, these purple tasks right here. And Lupe, who is going to be cultivating, was also going to be joining them right here. This is uh, less chaotic. That la this last one was like, this is like August, right? It's just crazy. The blue is, you know, all these irrigation things that need to happen. It was kind of crazy. Uh, this is so much nicer. <laughs> uh, this is a zoom in of, on one of these things. We call these little uh, tickets skinnies. This is a, pl a planting one. We tried to put as much information as possible on these things, um, but... Um, well, not the butt yet. This is what it looked like behind the scenes. Uh, we had some crop managers who would submit labor requests to us. And then I would take all these together and I would um, make it into that board. And then before in the morning of each day, I would meet with the harvest manager and the warehouse manager to see what tractors they needed because it was our goal to have as many tractors out in the field as possible um, because that we found having as many out there as possible in the windows when we could have tractors out made sure that all the work that we needed to have done got done. So because we had a finite number of tractors and harvest needed some for their harvest uh, tasks, we needed to uh, coordinate. So that was behind the scenes for that.
But yeah, the limitation of skinny is because there's only so much paper that's on there and it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you can't, can't explain everything on a tiny little thing. Some tasks I would uh, also include a map, just send a map out with people and all the uh, things that they needed to do. And certain people needed that more than others. Some people, it made sense for them, the skinny did, but other people were more visual learners uh, potentially, or just they just needed to see that map. No fault, just, just how they were. So we also had a giant map took, printed from Google Maps. This is a, a mosaic of that was you know eight foot tall, four foot wide map on the wall um, where we would record what we planted. I'll zoom in here. The pink sticky note on there is what is planned for. You can see the, this one says snowpack. This is going to be frozen peas that we rented that out for. Um, sweet corn is going to be down here. There's another zoom in on that. Some potatoes here. And then as it got planted, we would write it on. It would, there's plexiglass over the top. We'd write in what is actually there and how many beds are there so that we could refer to this when we're talking about those little sticky uh, skinnies. We'd say, OK, yeah, this I'd point at this at the screen and oops, sorry point at the, at the map, excuse me, not the screen, and say, this is where you're going to be doing that job. And that's a fully planted one right there. All right. So those are the systems on, on the farm and the tools that we used. I am going to be getting into, like, just, I'm just going to take us through uh, you know, the flow from propagation through harvest through through uh, warehouse of, um, of of the farm right at this point. And I'm going to try to do it fairly quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But I, uh, I think I'm going to stop share right now, briefly, and just ask y'all, like, do you have any questions about the tools and systems? Um, what questions do you have at this point before I move on? Uh, hey, Dan, this is Tate. Hey, Tate. Uh, I was wondering, how do you guys get plastic out? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That is that is a tool that I neglected to have in the tool section, isn't it? I will. I, that'll be in the irrigation section, which will be uh, in the middle. Uh, I, I'll be I think I'll be able to get to that in about 10, 15 minutes here. But it's a, a rain flow 1800, um, you know, undercutter bar thing that with a slicer down the middle. And then we would uh, silly enough, we would wrap it, you know, we would just wrap it around our hands, walk every, every mile of that and, and, and get it out that way. Um, I, I really think that they should get a, uh, a, it was, it was never in the budget, but it was something that needed to happen. It was a drip winder and, or a plastic winder. So that would be an automated thing or a mecha mechanized thing. Cause 83 miles of plastic, right? Gosh. Yeah, done, done, done the same thing, and um, probably, probably quite a few miles myself. So yeah, <laughs> looking for solutions. Yeah, yeah, no, and the and the winders aren't that expensive. You can get a basic one from Nolts, I believe, for fifteen hundred bucks. Which I mean, for some, I mean, for for a farm like Featherstone, fifteen hundred bucks is not that much money, right? Uh, it's it's um, it's it's uh, you know it's <laughs> it's um, you we spend way more than that on the labor to collect that plastic already. And you guys do it through old tape. Sorry, uh, Jason and then family, or Lynn, isn't it? Jason yeah, first. Right. Okay, first Jason. Was the Scott Viner the only real harvesting equipment or what else would you use for harvest? That, that was the only root harvester that we had. Um, we would use the, the, we had a broccoli harvesting like conveyor and a Nolts conveyor and the veg veyer for things that were just conveyed in to be boxed. But as far as a bulk harvester, uh, it was just the Scott Viner. Since I left and, and Grinnell Heritage Farm went under, they bought the root harvester that, um, that Andy and Melissa had over there at, at, at Grinnell Heritage. Um, but I, they, they've been, um, because they've got the Scott Viner system dialed, and that other one, they're still learning. They really, they still lean more on the Scott Viner than the one they got from Andy and Melissa. Lynn, what was your question? Yeah, what do you guys do with your tape at the end of the season? Yep. So it used to be just landfilled. 
but then there was a, uh, I've got a slide on this. There's a, uh, there was a uh, company that would recycle it um, that turned it into plastic bags. And it was because we were in a part of the country that had a lot of dairies still um, with the bluff country, you know, there's just a lot more dairies there and perennial alfalfa cover and such. Um, there was a lot of silage tarps that were being recycled into the same. And so they had a network of, of you know, a route that their truck would come and collect these dumpsters full of silage uh, plastic. And um, and they they would do the drip tape, but they wouldn't do the plastic mulch, sadly, because um, it cut down on our trash, but not all of it. And that was another reason we got that drip winder. We got the winder because um, that made a tighter ball of drip tape and we could fit more into the dumpster and it made it more worth the, the trucks while to dump a, you know, that, that into there. It was fewer trips for more uh, stuff. I see, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Carmen. Are you, are you at some point going to talk more about like the leadership structure of all the different, how, like you talked about the Kanban board, but not yeah. about how all of the different pieces fit together. No, yeah, good question. No, I can do that right now. So <laughs> like, let me go back to, um, uh, so no, actually I'm not gonna share the screen, but I'll, I'll um, it, there was, so I was the head of the field production team. My, my, I had counterparts who were the head of the harvest team and the warehouse team. And, um, Above us, the three of us, was the operations coordinator. And we submitted our, uh, our like labor needs to that operations supervisor each, each week. And that, and, and that person would look at the total number of hours that people had to spend on the farm. You know, 50 people times 48 was our, was our limit because Minnesota had agricultural overtime at 48 hours and we wanted to keep it under that. Um, and then distributed that all out after, after they looked at the tasks that were, that needed to happen. So, you know, we had more labor coming to field production in the spring and summer than we did in August, September, when all the crops were being harvested. And in fact, many of us in field production were done transplanting at that time when we joined the harvest team. Below me in field production was three crop managers who were managing each a third roughly of our acres and walking and scouting those things every um, week and making a list of what jobs needed to happen. And then I would triage all those things and make that big Kanban board. In addition to those uh, to those um, crop managers were the, we had an H2A team in field production who would transplant and weed and, tre and trellis tomatoes and things like that every day of every week. Oh, and, and run, the, those folks um, are now the like irrigation managers as well, or the irrigation manager, um, because irrigation was a thing that was just so piecemeal every year people there was no continuity um that was that became a, another job that h2a took over uh, as leadership on and then there were other people who were equipment operators and these were people um who originally were domestic but as but then have, have been migrating over to h2a as well um but there's you know assorted different workers under field production as well um Harvest, all the harvest teams, there are three harvest teams, all H2A, roughly seven people each, maybe six. Um, and then in warehouse, there were three or four H2A wor uh, workers as well. Um, there were people in the office. There was a marketing person who is in the Twin Cities. There used to be full-time uh, box truck drivers, but with more of that being hired out to, um, uh, you know, to a, a refrigerated semi delivery, it was just like one or two days a week, somebody would drive up and deliver those CSA boxes and the direct store delivery stuff. Um, does that help Carmen or does it too, would, would it be easier if you saw like an org chart? <laughs> I mean, I would love to see an org chart, but that did answer my question. Okay. I don't I, have. I, think, I, I wanted to ask a follow up. You mentioned there were office people. I was curious huh. about that, but because between that number of CSA shares and the H2A stuff, like clearly that's like a huge amount of work. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really was. So we had full time, full time marketing person in the cities. 
and they're selling CSA shares. They're, they're, you know, dropping in and checking in with the co-op manager, produce managers and, 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 and talking to Whole Foods corporate and, and such. Um, and then the office people were like payroll and, and paying bills. And that was, so there was a, there was a, like a, one person who was who was good at that stuff and, and and running QuickBooks and and all that stuff, and then there was a business manager as well who was like, you know, doing the H two A paperwork and, uh, you know, strategizing and things like that, and um, and then there was the owner Jack who was sort of like you know steering the ship uh, and 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 helping out and drive by driving the delivery routes and driving the tractor when he wanted to and, and, the, and, and things like that. But he would admit and, uh, and, and we acknowledge also that things when, when he was, if he ever got to his hands too much into the, to the, to the works, it worked less fluidly than if, if he, if he stayed out of it. Um, it was, he used to run everything, but then at this point it was just we all had our, our areas of responsibility and it worked pretty well when we were, uh, when we were doing that. Diane, I was also wondering um, kind of what, if on, on that sort of scale, what sort of water quantity you would want and, yeah. and what pressure you were, you were hoping for for all your irrigation systems? Yeah, most of our irrigation was um, was was not super high pressure. Uh, it was, you know, we had that Godwin pump would do, I think it was, uh, I wanna say it's 100 to 150 gallons per minute, but I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head. It, we were able to run uh, most of 75 acres um, on drip tape with that at, 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 at any one time. And then one, one field, one like four acre field of, of, uh, sprinklers. So, you know, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty capable. Um, but it, it, that, and that we can, I can share more later on. I don't have it handy right now, the model number of that, of that pump and the exact number of gallons, but it's, it, it is in the, you know, we're talking for this scale more in the hundreds of gallons um, per minute on this, on a, on a pump. And, um, and the, the pressure needs to be higher for those traveling guns, those water reels, but those can be upped, that can be upped by putting a booster pump right next to it, rather than having the whole system be pressurized to that high, high pressure. Um, and, and, and I should acknowledge also that up on the ridge, we didn't irrigate much at all. We had a single, like tiny little, like frost free hydrant that was on all the time it was domestic. Right. And it, it had a, and that went to 10,000 gallon tanks that had a float valve in them. And it would just, you know, it'd fill those and stop. And then as soon as it would fill, we would turn on a transfer pump that would pressurize drip tape for that system up there. And that stuff up there was mostly dry land farmed on the ridge. Um, there was not reliable water up there. And it was, uh, and it was not likely to be invested in it anytime soon because most of that land was leased and we didn't want to invest in that, you know, huge well uh, out there. All right, I'm going to share my screen again to blaze through. And I think what I'll do is I'll like talk about this as if it was like one crop, like a. Uh, uh, I'm assuming you can see that again. Is it, can Lance or somebody pipe in? Can you see propagation? Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. So let's say we're talking about broccoli here. We brassica seeds. We would almost always hot water seed treat these things. We made these little window screen pouches and put these in a in a igloo cooler with a and and poured you know hot and cold water into that thing and kept it at this certain temperature um, for a certain amount of time and then dried them in a dehydrator on very low and that was we'd get these you know either we would we would do this if the seed company had not already hot water seed treated them themselves and some of them would do that for us. We would, if we were reusing our trays, 
Uh, we would wash and sanitize all of those and we'd stagger stack them as you see on this pallet to dry in the in the cooler. Um, we were seeding in the warehouse um, in the in the first round of seeding. Peppers is one of these things that we would do early on in there and then germinate them on the warm uh, floor. Then uh, once it got warmer, this is a second, second succession of peppers um, on heat mats in the greenhouse. You can see these trays are being spot are potted up into 72s. But what I want to point out here is these labels. We were able to use our thermal printer to print out labels because we would be planting, you know, hundreds of the uh, trays of the same thing at a time. And so it would just be an really tedious to write those all by hand. Um, we had two greenhouses that we used for propagation. Um, this is one of them. The other one had movable benches, which allowed it to have more trays inside. The benches were on wheels and really only one aisle. You, if you wanted to get to the other side, you move the benches and walk down that, that other aisle. Um, we'd hard enough trays on trailers. We want, and, and the goal was just to handle them less. Uh, 80 trays fit on a trailer and the trailers go to the fields and we wanted, and we eventually got enough trailers to hold all the plants. And if it was going to hail or if it was going to be too cold overnight, we'd roll them into a third greenhouse, which was open and fit all of our trailers into it and uh, then bring it back out the next, uh, the next morning. We'd also do that for if it was going to be a strong thunderstorm in the summer. And we did this, we eventually got enough trailers because we had some really bad situations. This is all of our first sweet corn that got frosted um, out in the field. It did come back, but not very well. Uh, and also we would move the, tra the transplant trays out of the greenhouse onto the ground, then onto a trailer, then out to the field and onto the ground, and then, on, and then onto the transplanter to, to be planted. And, and that just made no sense at all to me. It was such a waste of effort. So we got enough trailers that we were able to put all of our plants on the trailers. We got our uh, soil fertility from Midwestern BioAg. Um, they would make custom blends for us and auger. They'd send their big old truck out and auger it out into 20 or so of these things that we'd put out in, these, uh, in the field in either a spreader like this or into the fertilizer hopper that uh, laid it down underneath the plastic that you can see right here. We got pallets and pallets of plastic, so we got a volume discount. Um, there is some logistics around using the two rollers on that if you wanna know more about that and you're not already using both rollers to splice well, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that, but I'm gonna move on. Um, I mentioned already that we use these, uh, this to make dirt beds. Um, we usually rototilled these beds to get them a little wider and get a better texture on them. You can see these ones over here have been rototilled and these ones have not. So um, mo most of our broccoli ended up going out onto, uh, onto dirt beds. This is a future cat, uh, brassica field getting rototilled. And this is also on a slope, so it's planted on the contour. Here's another one that's planted on the contour. This is broccoli and cabbage. And if you want to do this, I think it was with our NRCS office that we uh, talked to, to to get them to flag it for us so we could do that. Um, he, I was talking earlier, oh man, talking earlier about the um, just too wide, you know, pathway. Here's a strip of weeds that you'd need to come out here with a wheel hoe or a weed whacker or something to get because we just made these beds a little too wide. Another thing also is it would be better if there was a roller on the bed. Um, on the stale better because you can see these little troughs these we, these uh, these uh, carrots are in. If you're not careful when you're cultivating, the, the soil can get knocked over and bury those little carrots. So having them not in troughs is best practice. All right, direct seeding. We used Planet Juniors at, when I first got there. Three of them ganged together on the back, pelleted carrot seed. We use mostly two rows uh, is what we would do to leave uh, space in the middle for dirt to throw and cultivate. It also would help it dry out faster when um, harvest time came around. You can see it going in the ground there. All the seed, but it's buried nicely. We got this Mater Mac, which is great for singulation. It also planted these three parallel lines real close together, these bands of them. You can see this red arrow is pointing at the one, the bed that has a banded planting versus the one that's just, I think it might be two rows instead of three, three rows or in the band uh, with the one on the left there. All right, for transplanting, 
talked about this already. Um, we would water these trays, then take hitch these trailers up. This is our, just one succession of kale on these trailers right here, the second one. All aboard the transplant train. All right, this is heading out to the field to transplant. We've got our first day of transplanting 2017. Two trailers of kale and a transplanter. Following the hot dog tank full of fish. So that, that hot dog tank is this thing right here. It's full of fish emulsion mixed with water. And we've got our trailer of transplants right here. And then you can see a gap right here. This is a field road for spraying or harvesting. And most we did on our row, beds was three rows, but most beds in the plastic were two rows. Um, this is a dirt field where we're getting ready to use the other transplanter. You can see the bed shapers making beds over here. This one's rotted tilling. Um, I don't know if this was, uh, if we were really desperate, but ideally speaking, we would wait at least three weeks before we would plant a bed. So I think this is just a luck that we had three um, tractors all doing work up there at the same time. Um, we've seen this video already. Sweet corn we used with that mechanical 5,000 as well. Uh, we transplanted the first two successions so we could get earlier yield. Uh, we did hit 4th of July sweet corn one year up there, um, but I think, you know, down here that year, it might have been late June. Um, anyway, but SH2 corn is what we planted because it has a longer shelf life once it's harvested so that we can send it to the stores. We did use water wheels in the bare dirt for winter squash and logistics around around the hot dog and hamburger tank, you can see we've got a pump on this right here. We've got fish emulsion mixed with water in this tank and it just pumps so fast. You know, we, when we got to the end of a row, we would just pump that out and it would be, you know, we'd have full tanks in two minutes. Um, and and, and I, I've been other places where you're trying to fill it from a, you know, a, a domestic well or something and it just takes, uh, you know, half an hour to fill those tanks again and having fast turnaround was super important. So while Jen up there is filling these tanks, the other people are grabbing transplants and filling these racks so that there's very little uh, downtime when you get to the end. Um, we also had another tank called the hamburger tank and, you know, hot dog was long and thin like a hot dog. The hamburger was short and squat and round like a hamburger. It's kind of silly, but <laughs> it, it, it stuck. Um, somebody uh, was filling it from this bottom intake right here and hadn't taken the cap off here. And, it, and the, the pressure of our well was such that it exploded this whole tank. And uh, that was a $1,200 mistake that that person made. <laughs> And another fail, uh, when these transplants were, are so leggy that they are not likely to succeed very well. These are spaghetti squash. They would always get the leggiest on us. Um, too many days in the greenhouse, but it's hard to avoid that when you've got bad weather, but that's another reason to have redundancy, no, more transplanters. And we also spread out number of successions so that we wouldn't get stuck as much um, and backed up. And we also started direct seeding a lot more winter squash to avoid this. Cultivation, I, I said it already that we want as many tractors in the field as possible. Uh, I already showed you what these guys are. There are other cultivator tractors on the market. We didn't have any of these, but Alice Chalmers G, Case 265, John Deere 900 high crop. Uh, those are all older ones like these ones that are in the picture. And then some newer ones are like the Tillmore or the Ogun. And there's some Euro, some European models that are also very good, and um, but expensive and you'd have to import them. One thing that we really relied on heavily for our um, for our uh, cultivation was these cutaway discs, plus an L blade behind it. Um, this is what it looks like under the tractor. The cutaway discs have been removed from this on this older planting because uh, once the plants get too big, these discs will just slice the the plant off. But for baby carrots, it's really it, this helps you avoid having the soil bury those little baby carrots. Um, some other, so these are called alloways. They're old timey, cast iron, heavy as sin. Some newer ones that are on the market are called Cult Crest Duos, Stackety Ridge Cultivators, or you can piece it, something together from Tillmore with Hiller Discs and Tender Plant Hose.
which I've done on my, I did on my walk behind tractor when I was at Middlebrook. I can talk to you if you want to uh, more about that, if you'd like to put something like that together for you. Um, generally speaking, you want to cover all the, the bed space and the tracks in one pass and not have to come back and get, uh, you know, the second step. It's important to have these wheel track erasers so that you're where your tires are driving doesn't get uh, uh, weeds left in it. These broccoli plants here are getting too tall for cultivating tractors. So we had those, those four wheel drive high crops had a this thing we called the horseshoe, which would straddle the uh, the tall crops with long shanks and and going fast, you could get a couple more cultivations in. So this is a tall kale crop that's been horseshoed recently, but area that we were struggled to get clean was this area above or right on the irrigation. You know, you can't mow it because you might mow the irrigation. And I think it would be a worthwhile investment to just put in landscape fabric underneath the irrigation um, infrastructure so that you wouldn't have to worry about weeding or mowing that. And then you'd be able to see it easier and get closer. Um, plastic bed edges are super tricky, much harder to keep clean than dirt beds. So we were migrating towards more dirt beds because it was just less weedy. Um, Sogan Valley Farm in Minnesota is blowing straw and mulch in between their, their pepper beds that they are uh, planting these days. And some people are putting landscape fabric in between. This is a really crude way to, to get it done, but it worked for the first few passes that we would do. We would just hill more dirt on top with these big old middle buster uh, shovels underneath this uh, cultivating tractor. Later on, we would have to use, this is looking down on a side knife. So imagine the plastic mulch bed would be right in here. This curved banana shaped knife would slice away the soil at the edge of this of plastic and this hilling disc would build it back up. This might work better if this was a hilling spider uh, if you're familiar with that, it crumbles uh, soil better than, than a disc does. Um, but that's one way people are doing it. Oh, sorry. And I want to give a shout out to the Instagram uh, account of Dr. Farmer Brother, um, Nazirak Amen, um, who is using some finger weeders and spiders I've seen on there, which is uh, a Tillmore thing also, but is a good video on that Instagram account if you want to see some good plastic bed edge cultivation. Uh, flame weeding we were using as well on a tractor mounted system. We modified our Kubota L240H. You can see this is what the stock bar is, where the bar is mounted below the rotating, this little, this little joint right there. We welded this plate on here and had the bar above there to give some more clearance between the ground and the toolbar to get more tooling in there. Again, it, it is really nice to have some full-time mechanics on staff. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I misspelled mechanize on the top here. My goodness, Mac machinize when possible. But we still used handwork for those carrot weedings, those plastic mulch uh, retrieval, clipping every acre of that winter, of 12 acres of winter squash, collecting that winter squash, trellising tomatoes, rogue weeding, and most harvest. All right, irrigation. This is the root river where we pumped water from. I thought I had a picture of the pump actually in the uh, next to the water, but I don't. And it was roughly from the DNR for a permit. It was about 250 bucks for us each year to get 2 million plus gallons of water from the, from the river. Um, the one thing that, uh, you know, after being a food safety person that I wonder more and more about is like, what was in that water? Especially this is a tubing hot spot. A lot of people coming by here, drinking beers and, and tubing down the river. This is that pump, um, six inch high pressure lay flat or solid set aluminum that we would set out 30 foot sections. There were at least a hundred of these sections to get to the field. Looked like this, although this was a, a year we rented eight inch pipe. That's what Poncho is sitting on back here, eight inch pipe, um, but it wasn't worth the cost to rent that. So we bought some more six inch and, and, and use that. The idea being that eight inch has, because the bigger diameter has less friction and you can get more water out to the field. Here's a leak in one of our pipes. You can see the, get an idea of the volume and the pressure coming out of that thing. We got a number of phone calls about that from people driving on the highway, which is just back here. Uh, I think you've got a big old leak out there. And we did, but it was surprisingly not that big. Then we also had a pump uh, next to this pond that would pump to other fields with this pump. 
Uh, we used banjo fittings uh, religiously so we could easily disconnect uh, our irrigation setups and pressure reducers uh, before our drip tape so that it would um, not blow out our drip tape. Um, in our carrot and cilantro beds, we set up permanent sprinkler lines. This is three inch sprinkler line here. And uh, in all the other crops, we would rotate the lines around. And that entailed taking this pipe trailer out to the field and stacking the pipes on here. These 30 foot lengths of pipe. taking them to the next crop. And we, so we had that six inch pipe I was mentioning. It supplied a, this little hydrant that would shoot into this blue, blue lay flat that's three inches. And then it would supply the three inch line that's out in the field. This is a carrot field. So these are permanent lines that we let, would leave out there. Here's our water reel. Here's a video of the water reel in action. Here's the plastic mulch lifter. That's the best one I had. Sorry, I don't have a better one of that, y'all. And then we was wind it by hand. This is even before we got the drip tape lifter or winder and winding drip tape by hand. And this is Juan Luis who had rigged up a stereo speaker to his, his MP3 player <laughs> for, for some fun out in the field there. And here, uh, Lynn, here's that, um, that, uh, that drip tape recycling dumpster. Mm -hmm. And if you they want to take you feel free to call that number I, i'm pretty sure they're still in business and they you know see if they would be if there is one near you that you could drop drip tape into already maybe but yeah 30 percent roughly is what it cut off of our trash hmm. all right for pest control we were using boom sprayers um the, if you're not art if you're finding like i am that dipel is not working like you feel like it used to for your bt products you may try out this other one they're using deliver up there now which is a different strain of bt and they're finding it's working a lot better on the cabbage loopers and the imported cabbage worms uh, we would used in trust on flea beetles because we just had more acreage of brassicas than we could row cover so we were using a lot of entrust out, up there We'd use it also if the Colorado potato beetles got too bad, but we'd first rely on hand removal because we didn't grow that many potatoes. For deer, we would fence it out, uh, certain crops off like lettuce and melons. We didn't prioritize corn. We didn't really find a problem with them. Uh, we, did, we had so much corn that, that there wasn't a big enough population that they could make a dent in, in it really. But the melons, they would go and stomp it and eat it like a bite and, 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 or eat every single core out of every lettuce. And so it was a bigger percentage eaten of those crops. Black rotten cabbage nearly put us out of business in 2016. Um, and so we instituted a lot of um, cultural practices where we would start, we sanitized any tractor that had been uh, through the field where black rot had been seen. And if anybody needed to work in that field, it was the last thing they did that day, or they needed to change their clothes entirely. And after, if, if they left the field, the farm and went home, they couldn't wear those same clothes until they'd washed them. Of course, that's hard to police, but that was the general spirit of the thing. We also used some biocontrols. Um, these are some parasitoid wasps from, uh, for European corn borer, which which that same bad year of cabbage, we lost almost every single pepper to this European corn borer pest that was a worm that would go into the calyx at the top of the pepper and then have a worm inside of it. Um, we got a subscription of these things from a company called IPM Labs in New York, and we ordered them because the University of Minnesota has this uh, modeling. They trap and they keep records on when these things are flying and it's veg edge which is the website down there at the bottom you could just google veg edge and they'll show you that you can look at the maps or not the maps the the data around when these things uh, the charts of when these things are flying but it's hard to imagine but um <laughs> these things are so tiny I, when you think of a wasp but i've got a video on this next one like you can see them moving right there like they're just so tiny 
And that's a tiny little rubber band that's wrapping that card. You know, that card's the size of a business card. And I'm just, they're just so small. Sadly, they're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to not come out of the card until you put them in the field. But when they're mailed from New York and they sit in a hot mailbox, um, they will hatch faster. Um, we had a big problem with 13 line ground squirrels or they called colloquially striped gophers. And I've heard down here, people calling them grinnies. Um, we found rat traps with uh, peanut butter bait was semi-effective, pretty good. Um, this picture, if it's not clear, this is a sweet corn field and there's like a burrow like right here. And there's like, like this perimeter around, you know, this radius out from that burrow. And they just have eaten every single sweet corn seed and plant in that whole uh, radius. It was, it was pretty bad how much they, uh, uh, one little colony could take out. In addition, we were doing tissue testing, sending to ag source labs um, to, to add micronutrients and into our, or, and, and macros adding K into our tomatoes, um, and other micros as well that we had, we would get our liquid fertility from advancing eco ag, right? Harvest. Um, we've, you've all have seen the ca cabbage harvest already. This is the veg veyer that we use for cabbage and sweet corn. Here's the Nolts conveyor in action, harvesting melons. We'd also get zucchini and peppers, cucumbers. Being pulled by the high crop. It's a wet day, so the four wheel drive really helps with that. For winter squash, we, as I mentioned, we go through and we clip everything. So there's uh, here, there's a bed here, there's a bed here. There's a bed here. We'd clip them all and place the squash on every other bed. Then we'd straddle the middle bed and throw squash up to both sides of the, tra of the trailer. You can see it happening here from up top with some sunshine kabochas. And then here's broccoli, the broccoli belt, which has two conveyors out either side, a uh, platform for working, and a trailer that it pulls behind to stack the boxes on with a pneumatic uh, compressor here, an air compressor that would power, well, I'll show you in a little bit here, something on the, on the bench there. So there would be one or two people walking ahead of the tractor who would be harvesting and placing broccoli on top of the plants on either side so that it wouldn't get run over. Then the people up here would take that broccoli and put it on these conveyors. Oops, play the audio, oh well. This is Esteban, one of our longest term workers. He had been there for 16 years, very fast with the, with the harvest. Broccoli goes on the conveyor, goes into the middle, and these are, that air compressor is powering these pneumatic bunching machines where you put a, one of these rubber bands on these little metal posts. You pull the little handle up, you push the broccoli into there where a knife will slice the ends to make them all even and it'll release the rubber band to bunch the broccoli. These things are hard to source, but this is, uh, you know, comes out of California. It's a, it's a remarkable machine. And then those broccolis end up on the platform and they get packed into boxes, which end up on the trailer. And hopefully the trailer then makes it to the, to the, uh, to the warehouse, which it does more times than not, but this was <laughs> quite the accident. <laughs> in the warehouse, they will put a scoop of ice in there for better shelf life. And then this broccoli is in bins that uh, is being washed or just cooled with water and before it goes into the cooler with some ice to be stored for fall shares for a few weeks. All right, we looked at the Scott Viner already. Here's another video of it. Abby here is steering the thing with a hydraulic handle. You can set it on the carrot row. These orange shouts will lift up the carrot leaves. And she's placed a She's placed a digging plow manually that undercuts these things one row at a time at the beginning of this row. So these rotating knives up here are um, cutting the tops off. The carrots fall down and the conveyor here uh, takes them up. 
Here's a video of that all happening. All right, the warehouse, lots of wet wax boxes. We, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's zero threshold cooler doors. So you can roll a pallet jack right into the cooler without having to go up and over a lip. Um, there's a nice tight seal at the bottom of the door. That's so nice. And then trench drain right here for, for carrying water away. This, by the way, is the cool room. This is a climate controlled room that's kept at 40 degrees in the winter and something like 50 or so in the summer. It's where all the packing happens, where CSA packing happens, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, this is muddy carrots. Try not to do that. This is how we washed our carrots. Um, they dry in this, in this drying cooler overnight, then get dumped and bagged. Cucumbers got washed in the green line as well. A lot of bulk bins. We had almost 750 bulk bins, a lot of wax boxes that get purchased each year, tens of thousands of dollars of those things. Uh, here's the coolers, our cabbage and sweet corns in, in, in the cooler there. Here's long-term winter storage, carrots stacked five high. Here's Nathan taking inventory. Here's Adan stacking the bins for long-term storage, getting it all tetris in there. CSA packing, we'd, we'd put things into these bins and then one person would stand by an item and the box would roll down these roller conveyors here and we put one item each in. Here's a video of it happening. We didn't have enough space to cure onions indoors, so we did it outdoors typically. Sometimes when the weather wasn't so good, we'd try to do it indoors, but it was really not great doing it this way. All right, a couple of tips and tricks. Weld it on tool basket. Cultivate your wheel tracks while you're seating by putting these, uh, these shanks right here on by the wheel tracks on the belly of that. It's, if you are saving trays and you've been stacking them you know, precisely on top of each other, it, you'll know maybe that it's difficult to un to get them undone. If you stagger them like this, it's way easier to get them undone. Uh, we ran out of a, uh, uh, <laughs> we made a self-made backpack flame weeder here by, uh, you can see these bolts holding the backpack straps onto this uh, propane tank for a flame weeder. It's kind of janky, but it worked. Uh, here's a cheap dibbler by putting two trays together and just pushing down on those to make little recesses for your seeds. Biggest thing to Featherstone's Farm's success was working on relationships. Every year, this is, a, this is what having all the buyers, the produce buyers from the Twin Cities out to the farm for a tour given by Jack the farmer, a meal uh, that was catered uh, there. It was, it was so, this is just a snapshot of one thing to, that we did to build relationships, that Jack did to build relationships. And I think that's his superpower uh, is building those relationships. Um, also the strawberry social brought our CSA members because we were two hours away from the Twin Cities and having a connection to the farm for those CSA members was kind of difficult. Um, and by having a party for them out there at the farm each year and with, you know, all you can eat strawberries from the field on the summer solstice is usually when this was, you know, live music, food, it was, it was a special thing. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Another fail. I was trying to put a, a five-gallon bucket of fish emulsion into that hot dog tank, and it ended up slopping all over me, and I, I still have the stains on my car to prove it, I think. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for sitting through that. That is, uh, you can't see it over here, but that's slide 228 out of 229 right there. That's a lot of slides. Thanks wow. for sitting with it. Two minutes. Yeah, I know. Sorry about that. Took it right up to the end. What questions do you have after seeing all that? And I'm gonna write my email address in here and phone number. Shut the camera. Well, I did it without the camera. Sorry, say that. Say that again. And I have a question. Maybe you mentioned this at the beginning, but how long had has that farm been around? 
Yeah. yeah. Th- yep. So that farm was um, when like I was there. It was celebrating. Them to them to skip point. Sorry, Lance. Your your you were uh, connection has bad. So I was drawing out that thing. I heard you say how long has the farm been around, and um, it was twenty years while I was there. And so I think now it's been 25, 27 years. Was there another part to your question? Uh, like how long did it take them to get to that scale? Yeah. So um, I alluded to them having a bad situation with flooding earlier. And so after 10 years of being a growing farm, you know, me- medium sized farm, they were flooded out in a, in a crazy, like, you know, 18 inches in, in, in 24 hours flood. And they were in a Valley, you know, and just everything was funneled to them. That they, everything was, was gone. And so they borrowed a lot of money and built that whole infrastructure after 10 years thinking ahead, like, okay, we are on this trajectory. And, 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 and so um, that was a big jump at that point. And so they have sort of grown into that space, that size since then, but also by doing that, they've been saddled with a, a tremendous amount of debt that has, that, that is really the reason why in 2016, they al- almost went out of business because it was, it was, you know, inability to service the debt, which, isn't a, it's a cautionary tale, but it's it's not one that necessarily means you should never take debt out, take on debt to to grow a little bit. But um, they 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 grew maybe too big at that time. So seventy acres of vegetable production. Wow, they're doing they're at 200 now which would be a large farm sorry they started at three three acres wow like our size amy are y'all talking trying to ask a question right now all right i'm gonna mute amy all right Um, I am going to put, let's see, did I, I promised there was a, there was a link that I wanted to put in here earlier. Did I, which one did I, I put the YouTube in there already. What was the other link that I wasn't able to put in earlier? Was it the, oh, it was the, um, it was the vacuum seeder that I wanted to put in there. I wanted to get you y'all the link to the vacuum seeder. If you wanted to buy a cheaper vacuum seeder. Well, I'm looking for this. Do y'all have any other questions? I've got a couple of questions, Dan. Yeah. Um, is do you think they're they're on the trajectory to get rid of plastic completely? Um, is that a realistic goal for them? I don't think completely, but I think that it is their their goal to get rid of it significantly more, like to to really up the bare the bare beds, because it's it, it is just a it doesn't seem like you know you got you you use it for like tomatoes and things like that, right? But for the for the for the um, the 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 brassicas and things like that, it doesn't it was not always clear that it was the way to go. One benefit of it though, is that you can, it was the way that they were drip irrigating. And so because of all the fungal diseases that can happen on those brassicas, like black rot that they're uh, having problems with, that is, you know, it's definitely an incentive to drip irrigate that if possible. So the, I think the other alternative would be, you know, bare bed, pray for rain, and then use that traveling gun or get another traveling gun maybe um, to have more traveling guns um, to if there is ever a pinch where there's not enough water. So no, I don't think they'll ever go away from it completely, but it was, it was, everyone was always just like disgusted with how much we were using it. Brigham, yes, I can totally share my slides. Um, I will, what I'll do is I will, um, save it as a PDF, although that doesn't get you the, the, the videos, does it? 
The problem is that it's <laughs> with the videos, it's a it's a 700 gigabyte file. <laughs> um, and uh, oh no, no, megabyte, excuse me, 700 megabyte file, which is still giant. You can, you know, and and um, I don't know, maybe speak up, Brigham, and let me know. Would a PDF sat, be, be good enough? Or do, do you want those videos too? Oh, sorry, you're muted, Brigham. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that would be good enough for me. Okay, Lance, can I share tomorrow? Like, you know, it's get, getting late. If, can I turn it into a PDF tomorrow and send it to you? And then you can get it out to all the registrants? Yep. And then, yeah, if you have any other links, I mean, I could include the YouTube and whatever else too. Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, I put that cheaper vacuum seeder link in the thing there and the YouTube link is above that. Um, Dan, what about uh, water use? Like you're using your uh, overhead irrigation on carrots related to coming from the stream or is that all well water that you're sprinkling on the carrots it just depended on the field it was the food carrots were always grown in the valley because we didn't have reliable water on the ridge and it if it was on one side of the road then it was irrigated from the river it was on the other side of the road then it was coming from the well so it really depended on the uh on, on the source or, sorry it really depended on the location what the source was And uh, it should be noted that that the, um, since I left, uh, Featherstone has gotten GAP certified and is uh, you know they did, they've done the water tests and the water is not as gross as I, as I anticipated it would be the that that river water with their generic E. coli <laughs> counts, um, but still it's uh, you know you got to be smart about when you take your samples also. Are there anything else looking back, you know, like after you've left that you could say, oh man, it'd be really nice if they would have done this, had this system or had this piece of equipment or something like that? Mostly just that drip winder or the, excuse me, the plastic winder. Um, the, 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 the thing that they're looking at getting this winter um, is a flat filler that will, that you can just, you know, put the, put the, the plastic tray in and it puts all the soil in because we were just mixing by hand and shoveling it on into into flats you know and and it was it was so labor intensive so that's the next step i think for them and their propagation to get that um to get that better we made a lot of steps you know the vacuum seeder the um the and the and then they got that needle seeder but um i said i i think that they were i learned a ton there about about this I, and and I don't know if I you know they moved my knowledge base my knowledge of this stuff way far ahead and now I I, I think the only thing is that flat filler that I've really seen since then they've uh, to to really move to the next step of mechanization. Dan, can you maybe talk about how Featherstone compares to the other vegetable farms, kind of? I mean, the Twin Cities is a pretty big market yeah. for produce. So but how does it compare to other farms in that kind of region? Sure. In it's, scale and yeah, yeah. It's um in for Minnesota, it's the biggest, I think it's the biggest organic uh mixed vegetable farm. There may be a bigger like I, you know, there's a lot of canning vegetables and I don't know if there's organic, you know, uh, I do know there is snowpack does organic sweet corn, organic peas, those things. There's more acres organic that they're managing, but as far as like a mixed vegetable farm, Featherstone's the biggest one in Minnesota that's organic. Um, comparable size farm might be Harmony Valley over in uh, Wisconsin. And um there's a, you know, there's, there's a mixed vegetable farm in, in Iowa called Lopata Gardens that is, um, that is not organic, but is um, 125, 150 acres. Uh, and, but uh, the other folks, you know, are mostly doing, if they're big acreage here in Iowa, they're doing, you know, one or two, just a few, not, not very many crops um, like that. Uh, and they're buying in other stuff if they're selling at a roadside stand. Um,
Does that answer your question, Jason? Yeah. Okay. Well, it is, uh, you know, after when we were, when, when this is supposed to end, I am happy to stick around here for a few more minutes and answer questions if you, uh, if you have them, but you all should not feel like you need to stay on here um, if, if you, if you ready, want to uh, get off the Zoom now. Dan, I'm kind of yeah, curious. I'm going to ask the hard question. Okay, yeah. Um, can you share any numbers with us? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so our, um, the numbers I, I can share with you are that, uh, our, our gross sales each year were, uh, you know, $2.2 .2 million and, um, that, and, and we would end up with, I don't know, after labor and debt service and all those things, we were, we had about 30 to $40,000 to play with. At the uh, at the end of every year to to buy new things, um, they had the best. I hear they had the best year that they've ever had um, last year. Uh, pandemic, you know, buying increased CSA sales, et cetera, et cetera, um, and they ended up having you know more than a hundred thousand uh, of extra left over. So they were able to increase. Um, and I guess this Tate, they, they, the one thing that was always sort of a sticking point was our, our carrot washing setup, just like one green brush washing line, um, you know, shoveling it out into there and then sorting it by hand, you know, it's much more auto mechanized now. It's a, it's a bin dumper in, in onto a um, conveyor that takes it into a soak tank that then conveys it up into a, like a barrel that then spits that out onto a drying area that puts it on a sorting table, you know, so that was um, that, and that 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 also is a big thing that was put into an area of the warehouse that had to be insulated, and that uh, and with and a heater put in. So that is uh, another thing that has been improved since I was there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I see Shelly, you're jumping off. Uh, yep, thank you very much, Shelly. Take care. Um, so uh, I don't know if that really satisfies your your question because uh, I, I I would I, if I were you I'd want to know like what percentage of the of that two point two million dollars is you know going to labor and what percentage is going to supplies and things like that hmm. and unfortunately what I have it, because I was the field production coordinator is just the field production side of things mm -hmm. and our field production budget was like. Five hundred thousand dollars, maybe five to six hundred thousand dollars. There was a lot of, um, you know, warehouse had a lot of of, of costs with uh, with the wax boxes and things like that. Labor for H two A was was a was a big one. Hmm. Um, yeah, it was. So, what about those CSAs? Um, did yeah. you guys have like an average number of of items in a box, and how long was the season for? And do you know what yep. the subscription rate was? Yeah, it was like a 18 to 20 week and it was subscription rate was, I think like 550 to 600. Mm -hmm. um, it might've been 650. Um, I, and it was, um, it was, you know, it was middle of June through end of October ish. And the, it was like a meat and potatoes type CSA where it was the staples and lots of them. So mm -hmm. you got a nice, you know, two pound bag of potatoes and a, a nice watermelon and, and five peppers. And, you know, it was a little much, I think for, and I, I got the full size share when I was there. Um, we, we shelled up, uh, up for that one. Um, they, there was a half share as well. Mm -hmm. um, and since I left, they've gone to the Harvey customized model. And yeah. And, and that, because when I first got there, it was like 900 shareholders. And then the next year it was 750. And then the next year it was 650. Right, and right. The, and, and so uh, uh, the Harvey model got them back up to more like eight or 900. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic with the CSA craze of that got them even higher. But um, mm -hmm. it, it was um, number of items was, was somewhere around like 10, 11. Mm -hmm. Good. It was usually a, uh, the box was usually a bushel and a ninth box. Hmm. Nice.
Well, thank you very much. It's been a great presentation. This kind of opened up a whole new world to me. I, I'm uh, a lot like probably some of the other folks on here, a, a much, much smaller grower, but I've just had that curiosity. So uh, yeah, I had to scratch that itch tonight and you did a good job. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I figure, you know, it's hard to imagine something if you haven't seen it. And so exactly. I, I wanted to uh, at least, you know, let, 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 let folks know what, what it, you know, what it took maybe to, 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 to do it on that scale. Yeah. Indeed. It was great. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm my, my phone number and my emails in the chat. If you, uh, if you want to reach out, please feel free. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Hey, sorry. Real quick question, yeah. Dan. Um, yeah, Brigham. You just used the word Harvey and I tried to Google it. And I don't know what you Oh mean. yeah. H-A-R-V-I-E. It's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a, what's the company that put that out? It was, um, what? Is it Barn to Door or is that a different one? No, it's a different it one. But small I mean, farm Simon Huntley. Small Farm Central. Yes, Small Farm Central. Thank you, Carmen. Yes, it was it was put up by Small Farm Central. Yeah, and and um and and so it's just a they take a a cut of the of your of your CSA sales. I think it's like seven percent. Um, and uh, are you, Carmen? Are y'all a, a a Harvey Farm? Absolutely not. That's a large cut. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I mean there's there there are people who who it has really helped. There are people who did it and are not not doing it anymore. There are other people who are just like no way I don't want to do that. I want and there there are other customization systems that you can use. But that is one that is sort of plug and play that um Featherstone ended up opting for. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think the key thing Dan you mentioned earlier is the fact that customers can customize their order. Yeah. And the retention rate is, is really a lot better with something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I hope you have a really good night. Good night to your kitty, <laughs> Carmen Maya. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everybody for joining. And thank you, Dan. You're very well. Hey, thanks for doing it. Good job. My pleasure. Thanks. Okay. I'll Bye. Yeah. I'll send you that PDF tomorrow, Lance. Okay. Thanks. Good night, y'all. Good night. See ya.